Hi to everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Marco Pietrobon from uh, ERG Group uh, uh, of Politecnico di Milano. Okay. And uh, we are happy today uh, that uh, we organized this webinar with uh, one table speakers uh, from uh, the Renew School project. I let uh, uh, the, the word to uh, Armin Notzer, uh, who moderate uh, the event. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, hi, everybody. It's Armin Knotzer from the AE Institute for Sustainable Technologies in Austria. Um, I was the lucky one because I coordinated this project and um, it's of course a little bit sad uh, moment introducing one of the last events here uh, taking place in the frame of Renew School project but um, we did a lot of work over the last year, three years and now we want to conclude a little bit what we have done and um, so we say uh, welcome to this webinar and um, we will show you a few results um, and outcomes uh, we want to present uh, to the public. Um, and I think um, you see here the agenda. Our uh, correct title is School Renovations Quick, Affordable, Green and Healthy, Real Examples and Outcomes from the Renew School Project. It, it was an Intelligent Energy Europe project. So we did a lot of analyzing and uh, promoting work in this project. But I, I think you will see it, um, and uh, you see here the agenda um, from this webinar. Um, it's first me, myself, um, a little bit uh, having and giving you an overview of the work we, we did here with real examples. The second is Stefan van Loon from Pixie, former Pacifus platform in Belgium about cooperation models and successful processes. Third is Christian Ankerweed from uh, Technical University of Denmark, winning concepts and technologies for school building renovations. Um, the third, it's here wrong, uh, it should be the fourth um, presentation, it's uh, Indoor Environmental Quality and Learning in Schools from Pavel Vargotsky, also Technical uh, Danic, uh, Danish Technical University and uh, the fifth is opportunities for trainings and awareness raising because we had a lot of work on school projects and also trainings for the target groups. Um, okay, so I will start. As I said, I want to introduce shortly the project and then bring a few real examples because uh, as I said before, we had a lot of real projects uh, analyzed in the in the uh, Renew School project, and we want to tell you and uh, we want to show you how our Renew School way of re school renovations is like. And I will talk about this the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so I will talk about the project very short, then the solutions and real projects, and then conclusions. Uh, first, as I said, the project uh, promotes and increases high energy performance and prefabricated timber-based renovation of school buildings in Europe. So it was really the focus on um, high indoor air quality, um, in, uh, integrating renewable uh, energy, and uh, but the main thing is how can we quickly and with high quality renovate our school buildings. And we, have a, we had a cooperation and still have uh, of nine countries and 13 partner organizations. You see the map here, the European map. And uh, here again, the consortium. Um, uh, it was really a, a nice group to work with. Um, so the next thing I want to show is uh, what target buildings uh, do we have here in this project. We have, as you can see here, uh, heating demand in megawatt hours per year. We have a lot of buildings um, in Austria and I think all over Europe. This is an Austrian uh, example where we have a lot of buildings between 1960 and 1980s. And um, also the school buildings, of course, are very relevant in this um, 
years in these uh, 1960s until 1980s because the structure was more or less uh, poor because quickly constructed and uh, we now have to renovate a lot of these buildings. Um, our overall target in Reno School um, have been the followings, uh, comprehensive retrofit, we wanted to have quick construction time or renovation time, no temporary containers for the pupils, we wanted to apply wooden prefabricated elements, we wanted to achieve high indoor air quality, uh, sufficient daylight and intelligent shading and glare control in schools, in the classrooms, then we wanted to integrate renewables uh, as much as pop possible in the school buildings. And in the end of the project, at least in Austria, it was a big issue also, uh, which uh, um, was very important to see that educational concepts are also important to include in the integrated planning process. So we have these existing schools, like you see here, uh, of an uniform typology all over Europe. This is uh, the basis of all things we do here. Um, and then we analyzed the processes of different renovations. And I want to show only two examples here. The one example is one from Norway, where we see that uh, a design a build process um, is can be like this, where you have in the beginning very clear targets, uh, which was here uh, that uh, they had to reduce a lot of CO2 emissions uh, doing this renovation. And this it was not a renovation, sorry, but a new building. But the aim was CO2 uh, emission reduction. And they uh, came to a planning team which said we wanted to apply a wooden construction and it was clear more or less from the beginning and then all the process afterwards, the tendering, the planning and so on was very clear and there was of course one, um, uh, one process saying on-site works or preparation and off-site where the prefabricated elements were done. The second strategy process of, uh, of the renovation was the one, for example, in Neumarkt in Austria, where we had uh, at the beginning more or less unclear what should be the aim of the renovation. Uh, when the municipality thought of the renovation, they um, tried to implement criteria and later on they saw okay, there is a planning team, they suggest prefabricated elements, for example, or uh, sustainable materials. And then um, they, they thought, the municipality, municipality thought uh, it would be a nice way to uh, renovate. And so they decided very late to uh, choose for the uh, prefabricated elements. And then you have also a uh, planning process like we had before, on-site works, uh, production off-site, but very detailed planning in a very late phase of the uh, renovation. So you can see there are a lot of different processes going on. And of course, a very good one would be the last one, the first one, where you have very early a decision for uh, sustainable renovation and very clear criteria before. And uh, this would be very good. And of course, also in Renew School Project, we did uh, a lot of work on analyzing these processes. But um, later on, uh, Stefan will talk about it. So um, what we uh, aimed for was uh, prefabricated solutions. As you can see it here for a residential building, where we have a few nice picture how you do that. Um, there can be, of course, uh, prefabricated facades um, as horizontal elements, as you can see it here, where you have a wooden frame construction and uh, mount it uh, onto the uh, old facade and then bring in the, for example, cellulose insulation on site. But it can also be um, another way, uh, as you can see here, with vertical elements. And of course, they can filled 
they can be filled uh, with insulation or not. So both uh, things are possible. Um, here you can also see very simple elements as they were used in Neumarkt in Austria. And you have an equalization layer in this picture in the middle up here uh, at the old existing wall. And then the simple element uh, is mounted on this uh, equalizing layer. Um, and uh, of course, also the equalizing layer is filled with insulation here. Um, so a lot of different solutions how you do this. Uh, important is that you have really good construction details, like you can see it here from a wall in, Aust in an Austrian frontrunner building, so that all the companies working on that are very clear what to do on site uh, with this construction. This is really important. And also, of course, it should be clear how you fix uh, the elements, um, as you can see it here. Uh, directly uh, on the, uh, for example, concrete construction, or you can also fix it uh, um, on a new construction uh, layer uh, when the existing one is not stable enough. Um, very important is also the lighting concept, as you can see it here, for example, in Schwanenstadt, so that you can think about um, do you need um, more uh, openings for the facade or internal openings, as you can see it here in this classroom and at the bottom left, uh, where they have from both sides uh, daylight coming into the classroom. And also think about the color concept, uh, that, you, that you have more or less uh, a living zone for the pupils. Next would be, I uh, think, about the ventilation concept. If, if it's a mechanical, central, decentralized, um, if you want to have a hybrid, so a mixture of natural and mechanical ventilation, it's very important to be clear about that before. Then also think about monitoring, like we have it in a lot of buildings installed, like here, for example, again in Neumarkt, we have three class, uh, two classrooms and one teacher's room, which is monitored over um, the, the operation years now. Um, I think they are monitored it's now six or seven years, so they know very detailed uh, how is the indoor air quality, for example. And we also analyzed in all school building the energy supply. And of course, we want to come to more renewables. And you see here in our front runner buildings in Renew School, we have a lot of biomass heating, heat pumps, and some natural gas. And also PV is included in a lot of schools and even one with wind power. So here is an overview about uh, the Austrian examples and the facilities they included only to give you an example uh, how it can look like and what they apply. Um, now I want to come uh, to the real projects um, where I want to uh, give you an overview of uh, what we uh, analyzed in Austria and in some other countries, but mainly Austria. Here again, Schwanenstadt, as you can see the old building in the left and the new building in the right and the process in between, how the uh, how it was implemented here, uh, this very quick renovation. Um, and uh, the most important thing is that you have normally, of course, improvements. And in Schwanenstadt, one of the first buildings uh, built like this, we had a few improvements on the cooling, on the outdoor shading, and on the ventilation. Uh, and also on the noise insulation of the ventilation units, for example. So you can uh, have in operation, when you have monitoring, you can uh, be very clear about what to improve after one or two years. That's, I think, in every of the buildings, very important to see what you can improve. And um, this is another example from Austria Rheinbach. They want to... Um, apply a plus energy concept here. You have all the data here. I think the most important thing is that they mostly start with passive house standard from the uh, building envelope, and then the rest uh, can be um, 
supplied by PV or by solar thermal system or by uh, wooden chips uh, heating system or so on. Um, they also used very simple uh, prefabricated facades here, as you can see. And what is also interesting to see here is that uh, a complex cooperation uh, model is used mainly in the school renovation. So be careful in a process of school, school renovations. You have also uh, a lot of involved uh, parties when you want to um, renovate it uh, in a high qualitative way. Um, and we wanted to uh, visualize here that uh, it is a very complex relationship between the different parties and you should be really uh, careful about uh, doing this cooperation here in a uh, good way. So, um, and in the, in the last part of my presentation, uh, I call it solutions meet education because uh, I think it's a very important uh, thing that we include uh, in uh, all the technical solutions and also architecture, also the educational system. And um, we have seen a lot of schools like here in Denmark, <coughs> we bangen, that it uh, can be uh, nicely included um, in school buildings, um, also educational things. Um, and uh, you can use a lot of culls, for example, or areas where the uh, pupils can rest or sit at the stairs uh, or have, of course, um, hidden places where they uh, can talk in smaller groups and so on and so on. Here, example from Austria in Alberschwende, where they also tried to um, do the school like a, a living lab, so to say, and um, a few impressions here. All of these schools use mechanical balanced ventilation here in Austria. Uh, the next one is uh, in Doren, also in Vorarlberg in Austria, where you can see they did um, uh, like a learning clusters where three um, different classrooms uh, work together in one bigger space in the middle of, of this uh, area. And uh, it is also nicely implemented here, this uh, combination of wood and um, existing school uh, or from concrete structure. Um, they have also uh, launches for teachers, for example, extra room for teachers that they can work also nicely. And here another example, a primary school in uh, Wolfurt in Vorarlberg we can also see they did a lot of, of work on the uh, inside furnishing. Um, here a classroom in another school, um, which I want only to show that it not always has to be very um, clean and clear here. It could also be mixed up a little bit with different things in the classroom. Um, here another uh, living room in the school which you, which the pupils can use. And here um, a very last example from Styria where they had also a wooden constructed school uh, with a, a common space in the middle of the school which you can also use for different learning uh, concepts. Okay, conclusions, um, very short, prefect we, we want to establish uh, prefabricated pre wooden elements in our school renovations because we have a lot of uniform typology which gives you a uh, potential for timber engineering. We have very short construction works on site. We, can, uh, we have a more intensive planning phase but leads uh, normally to uh, a better quality assurance process. We can have uh, different facilities integrated in the elements. We have, of course, much better working conditions for the workers uh, in the factory halls. We can use sustainable materials. Uh, we can um, have, uh, we have uh, much more in the end of the project, uh, the promised budget used 
And uh, the last thing is uh, this, that the satisfaction of the mayors uh, using that is very good. Um, so again, I want to say uh, we need a school, uh, not only uh, with all the technical solutions, but also as a really nice living room. And um, I only say thank you for your attention, and I hope you will follow uh, a little bit more on the Renew School websites. Okay, thank you very much. And I now want to give uh, back to um, back to the yeah to the to another presenter. It is, I think, um, it is Stefan. Yes, thank you. Uh, and Marco, can you please? Uh, give Stefan the, possi the possibility to present about cooperation models and su su successful processes to achieve sustainable retrofits. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we were the work package leader of, uh, we were the leader of work package three and we were looking to cooperation and financing uh, the constructions. And um, the reason why we were doing that is uh, more of the view of uh, quality assurance uh, process. So first of all, the Renew School approach was uh, to make, to raise the awareness um, by, at the building owners, uh, that's not only the building cost um, <clears throat> is counting, but only uh, the cost for temporary relocation. Um, which also gives a big organization cost, not only the relocation cost, but also the organization of that relocation has a big impact. Um, all the other points, uh, like better indoor air quality and energy performance contracting, we will uh, have a word on that in these presentations. Christian will and uh, Paul will do the presentation about indoor air quality. So <clears throat> what we saw in uh, Belgium, but also many of the experience we saw in Belgium, we saw it also in other countries we visited. Um, so one of the uh, problems is that a lot of the time, a lot of times the design team is paid by a percentage of the construction costs. And we think it's not always a good idea to do that um, because it can uh, stimulate the designers to to rise the cost so that they earn a little bit more money and that's not always the best solution uh, uh, we have seen here in Belgium for example that uh, a certain engineering company would like to um, implement a solution technical solution with a return on investment of 99 years um, so we are quite sure that the building owner didn't saw the that uh, um, the what was the real life cycle cost of that uh, solution. So we are quite sure that we have uh, to go in the future more and more to performance contracting instead of funding commitment. Yeah, that would be a really good thing. We saw that also in other uh, projects in uh, for example in Denmark in uh, also in Norway and also in Slovenia um, that not on, not always the 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 quality the indoor air quality and not only the air quality but in general the environmental quality like temperature humidity is not always always the same like um, the building owner wants to have or that like uh, they had in mind uh, when planning the project. So there is really a need to performance contracting. So we need to measure afterwards what are the really <clears throat> performances. Uh, so not on paper only, but also in reality. And <clears throat> for having that, uh, <clears throat> um, What's, what's the main problem um, to, to get there, 
today is that uh, a lot of the contracts are based on the, the cheapest constructor uh, gets the contract today. And uh, most of the time, I, uh, often, is that um, it's not so easy to describe 100% uh, fitting technology product solution. Um, so uh, sometimes the, the cheaper uh, constructor comes with alternative products which doesn't meet the real requirements uh, because there is maybe a, a small uh, gap in the in the contract. Uh, also, the each small imperfection of that uh, contract can give uh, hefty surcharges on that uh, on the price of the contractor. And another thing which is uh, very often forgotten is that uh, some constructors, they make themselves indispensable to the maintenance uh, phase. So that means they offer the cheapest solution to, to implement, but they make themselves indispensable in the maintenance, fact, in the maintenance phase. So that means that they can ask uh, a lot of money to do the maintenance because they are they are the only party who can do that. So that's not really a sustainable solution always. So um, now, specifically to the wooden prefab construct constructions, in Belgium we didn't have a lot of uh, let's say uh, examples uh, in the renovation sector, um, so that. Uh, forced, uh, forced us to look to other solutions in new buildings in Belgium because we are really a uh, land of brick, let's say. But we found uh, some beautiful projects and here you see some uh, um, constructors who are making those prefab modules in a uh, protected environment. So the quality uh, assurance process is a little bit uh, more easy. It's packed on a truck, and the mounting uh, systems are um, that far uh, developed today that not only the wall itself with insulation, but also the windows, the framing of the windows, and also the bricks are already in the in the module mounted so they can uh, mount it in just a few days a complete uh, building which is a, a very good development I think uh, and that all saves time during the mounting phase but it doesn't mean that you save a lot of time in the planning process because the planning process is uh, let's let's say much more accurate huh? Um, we are quite sure that um, in Belgium we have a very good example with the School of Hurst and Zolder. I didn't put a picture of it in it, but um, they told um, that they were uh, very successful and it was thanks to have a good um, sharing all information uh, via a BIM module, yes. So we are think BIM is really the solution uh, for that. But um, what we see is uh, in the beginning, and that's very important for building owners, that um, the criteria they specify in their contracts, uh, and that's before they are stepping to a designing uh, to a design team, that there is a lack on information in their criteria. So they first have to think always before they start a project, what are all our criteria? And first, they have to think about the functional needs of the future, to think about which comfort level we need on all certain aspects, on thermal comfort, on acoustic, on visual, on indoor air quality. And what, what very often, what they very often forget, forget is to specify a user profile. So we, they have to determine how many persons are in a room for how many time which equipment is used and which activities are done there. So it's really needed that it's described. Um, 
Another thing is uh, in renovation that it's very important to go and take a look on your building to see if it's possible to renovate your building in such a way that it's 2050 ready. So um, our uh, team here in Pixie has created a tool for that to see, uh, we call it Axi Planner, to see um, how um, if that's really possible eh? and what's more or less the cost. Uh, it's of course very difficult to to uh, to determine the cost exactly, but it's a rough uh, fork uh, we say to to see okay how what budget we need for that to do it exactly and if is it possible to meet those requirements? We have to go to let's say 90% or even more uh, CO2, CO2 reduction. Then on cooperation model uh, level, we uh, we see that it's preferably to work in a uh, building team, bow team as they all, as they all say, um, because then all knowledge, not only from the architect, but also from the constructors can combine together in one integrated uh, design process which momently moment momentary also uh, is a problem uh, often because the architect doesn't know uh, a lot of uh, prefab constructions today a lot of designers um, so we think that build, uh, working in a building team uh, has a big advantage in that way um, maybe you can also think about financial incentives uh, for making a project cheaper or more energy efficient. Uh, also gathering as built project data afterwards is not that easy, we see. So a lot of uh, building teams, uh, no, let's say building owners, um, they have a problem with getting all project data afterwards. So. That means that um, very often programming code, which is in the control system of the building, is our black boxes. So nobody can see what's in, and that's a big problem because then only one company can uh, can serve you. Yes, and that's not a good idea. So maybe it's a good idea to to require that all programming code is open for everybody. Uh, so that means you need to require, in my opinion, a maximum transparency and avoid black boxes. Uh, that's not only in drawings, also drawings, for example, you need them in DVG or DXF um, because maybe on a certain moment after a few years, you need another extension on your building and the architect uh, where you worked with is maybe that or his company failed or whatever what reason uh, so all drawings you need to have them in the original uh, drawing code so um, that are thing I think the most important things uh, to say um, maybe okay. afterwards you have some questions I thank you for your attention thank you very much Stefan um, <clears throat> It, so it, that was uh, uh, concluding what we did on cooperation models and uh, mainly what uh, Pixie and Stefan did on that. Thank you very much again, Stefan. Uh, next would be or is uh, Christian Ankerwied, uh, assistant professor at the Danish uh, Technical University. Christian, do you like to introduce shortly yourself and the uh, title of your presentation? And Marco can I ask you to give Christian the words. Thank you. Well, good day, everybody. My name is Christian Will. I am an assistant professor at the DTU, Technical University of Denmark. And the title today here is Winning Concepts and Technologies for School Building Renovations, which is a rather broad uh, title. So um, I have taken the liberty, the, the, the liberty to uh, focus on facade designs, which is of course in the context of Renew School, is about 
retrofitted uh, facades, and about ventilation solutions, which we have also investigated. <clears throat> And uh, I will talk about robust facades of designs and robust ventilation solutions. Robust meaning that these are tested and accepted and proven uh, solutions that uh, work uh, even though there is a, a, a small margin of installation error, which is of course often the case in building construction uh, projects. Um, <clears throat> so first I will focus on uh, robust facade designs, which is uh, a uh, quite important matter, in f especially in the northern parts of Europe. Apparently, this is not such a big problem in the southern parts of Europe where this project initially comes from, but uh, due to our Swedish partners and some Danish uh, uh, investigations, uh, we think that this is a matter of concern. When we look into timber facades and use timber facades for retrofit, here we see a normal timber facade with the wooden posts, the insulation, the cladding, and uh, this is how a, uh, a sustainable uh, retrofit facade is, is usually uh, constructed, and then it is mounted on the existing facade. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there are two different types of facades, uh, of retrofit facades. There are the ventilated facades and there are the non-ventilated facades. The ventilated facade has an air gap between the cladding and the structural elements. And this means that any precipitation that passes through the outer cladding is then ventilated away and cannot penetrate even further, further deeper into the, uh, into the construction. A non-ventilated facade relies on the moisture diffusion capabilities of the materials uh, to keep the structure dry. And of course, this is a more critical uh, solution, especially in the more moist uh, weather conditions we have in Denmark, in Sweden, and perhaps also in, uh, in Germany, or at least in some parts of Germany. Uh, <clears throat> The ventilated facades employ what we call a two-stage ceiling, whereas the unventilated facades employ a one-stage ceiling. And as you can see here, we have uh, the existing wall concrete uh, masonry, uh, the gray boxes you can see. And uh, on those, uh, we have uh, uh, retrofitted the, uh, uh, the, uh, the new facade, which is consistent of insulation and wooden posts. And as you can see, in the ventilated facade, the rain protection and the wind protection are two separate uh, barriers in the uh, in the wall, and therefore we have a two-stage uh, ceiling from the uh, precipitation that may uh, hit the surface. On the right side, right hand uh, side of the screen, we have a rain protection and a wind protection that is. Uh, uh, that is combined, and if any uh, rain or, or, or uh, water is driven through the outer protection, it then gets into the insulation and the wooden posts. And uh, wood is not uh, uh, very good friends of uh, moisture. So this is uh, some of the uh, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, learnings we had here in the new school project. Um, so moisture can also come from uh, from the inside, and uh, it's important that the existing uh, concrete wall or masonry wall is uh, protected uh, or is sealed so that you don't get internal warm moisture uh, uh, coming uh, coming from inside out into the ex out into the new facade. So the quality of the existing facade must be assessed, and the joints uh, should be sealed uh, in order to avoid moisture uh, from the inside. However, uh, when you mount the, the facade, uh, the existing wall is in balance with the relative humidity of the outdoor, which means that it has a certain amount of water content uh, already in the facade, and this cannot be removed before you retrofit the new facade. So whatever uh, humidity is there in the existing wall is trapped behind the new wall. And this is not uh, something that we have, uh, at least not uh, in the other partners of the new school have met this problem. But uh, we uh, hear that in Sweden, that in Sweden they have a very moist climate, and I think that we will also have that in Denmark. Uh, we just haven't seen the problems yet. But uh, at least in Sweden they have regulations that says that uh, you must not have elevated moisture contents 
in your in your uh, behind the behind the new facades uh, for more than uh, six months. Um, and as you can see here, here's a construction with the existing uh, with the existing wall, and then the retrofit with the wooden posts and the insulation, and then there's a vapor barrier here by the green error, uh, which is supposed to uh, protect the uh, construction from internal moisture. But this, in fact, traps uh, the moisture instead, and uh, and uh, and it's important that that this vapor barrier is in fact uh, not uh, vapor tight, that it is vapor open instead of vapor tight. And also in general, to avoid trapped moisture in any uh, type of uh, construction, uh, the materials of the facade uh, must be mounted in the order of increasing vapor permeability, which so, so that the, any vapor that is behind the new facade can then diffuse out. And here we have curves that shows on the left side vapor type membrane. You see the, the blue curve is relatively high for a very long extended period. And on the right side, you have the vapor open membrane where you see the blue curve goes down to 75 and 50% in a matter of a few weeks. So this avoids the growth of mold and other uh, deterioration mechanisms uh, behind the uh, otherwise new and uh, nice uh, facade. So <clears throat> um, now uh, to something uh, about uh, ventilation, some robust ventilation solutions. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of different types of ventilation solutions in schools, uh, ranging from central ventilation solutions to decentral to uh, micro units uh, mounted below the uh, below the window, to exhaust solutions, to uh, to uh, airing, uh, manual airing, where pupils and teachers have to open the windows to get fresh air. Um, those can be automatically controlled, and they can then be combined in different types of uh, hybrid uh, solutions. And uh, these are these are these are systems that are employed and in, uh, in, in ventilation. Uh, for, for, for ventilating school and classrooms uh, today. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, some years ago, we uh, monitored uh, 85 schools, uh, monitored the uh, ventilation rate in different classrooms, and it was quite clear that uh, uh, mechanical solutions, those are the blue ones you see here, uh, were simply surpassing the uh, manual solutions, which are the red ones you see uh, down here. Uh, <clears throat> and this picture is, is uh, basically quite clear that uh, you need mechanical uh, solutions to exchange the amount of air uh, that is necessary in a classroom where pupils are sitting uh, closely together and emitting a lot of uh, bioeffluence and CO2 and so on. It's 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 quite difficult to provide that amount of fresh air to a classroom simply by opening the windows, um, especially in northern parts of Europe and also in eastern parts of uh, central parts of Europe where uh, winter is cold, uh, you can, for many months of the year, simply not uh, open the window. It's, it will create draft and, and, uh, and discomfort in these, uh, in these, uh, with these solutions. Um, <clears throat> we did some indoor air quality monitoring also in the new school front runners, and they are all equipped with the central uh, mechanical uh, balanced systems that supply and extract air uh, from every classroom. And on the top graph here, you can see the uh, CO2 concentration in the different types of uh, class uh, classes. And as you can see, uh, they're quite uh, close to what we would like to have. Um, they're quite close to 1000 ppm CO2. And to the right, we have the red. Uh, school uh, schools which are more conventional schools and as you can see they are uh, not that much higher but definitely higher than the than the other solutions I would have expected that these would have been higher in fact especially 
uh, with the uh, previous uh, graph in mind. In terms of temperature, it seems that they are also performing uh, quite well, these front runners here with central balanced uh, mechanical uh, solutions. Uh, the Danish uh, the Danish schools here and one from Italy here are seeming to be a bit warm and there's also some problems in, in Austria with with over temperature, overheating uh, in the classrooms. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in to to conclude, uh, we have two different choices of uh, balanced uh, ventilation in classrooms. We have the central systems, which we can see on the left side, and with decentralized uh, systems, which we can see on the right side. And the central system has certain advantages uh, uh, in, in some respects, and the decentralized system has other advantages in other respects. Um, the central system um, or consists of air heading units mounted in, in a few places, as you can see here with the red dots here, and then there's a, a lot of duct work uh, distributing the air to the different classrooms. Um, meaning that one air handling unit can serve a lot of classrooms, um, which means that they are uh, relatively easy to uh, to maintain, to change the filters, uh, doesn't uh, take a lot, a lot of time. However, all the duct work, that requires a lot of space. You need balancing um, so that you get the right amount of indoor air, uh, the right amount of ventilation to the different classrooms. And you also need uh, to control the air, uh, you need CO2 control in every diff in every classroom to make sure that you uh, have the supply of uh, fresh air that you need uh, in all uh, in all uh, times in all the uh, in, well the entire day of a uh, of a of a uh, of a school day. <clears throat> the decentralized system. Is, a, is more simple in the way that you have a compact room unit mounted in every single classroom and uh, it serves then only one classroom. Uh, this means that you don't require any ducting. Uh, the control is totally integrated in the unit. Um, however, you need to consider the aesthetics of such a big unit sitting in the room. You need to consider uh, noise because you have the fans, you have all the mechanical parts in the classroom, so noise and vibration control is uh, matters to think about. Um, <clears throat> and you need also to consider where is the air intake and where is the air exhaust to avoid uh, uh, cross contamination from one uh, duct uh, from one uh, from the inlet to the from the exhaust to the uh, to the inlet. Um, <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> we have uh, investigated the installation uh, and the maintenance costs over 20 years of uh, these two types of uh, systems uh, because this is a matter that we often hear that uh, central mechanical is, uh, is, uh, has a, a lower service cost than decentral uh, ventilation solutions. But in fact, from the numbers we could find, uh, it seems that the two different solutions are quite similar. Um, um, the 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 uh, the, uh, the amount of time it takes to change the filters in a decentral ventilation uh, solutions is is relatively quick. In in three, four, five minutes, you can you can change the filters in in one unit, and of course. If you have many filters, that can take one day, but uh, this is not a very large uh, maintenance cost uh, in comparison with the rest of the maintenance costs of a of a school. Um, so, uh, the, so 20 years of net present costs, uh, the two solutions, they perform uh, almost on par. Um, <clears throat> Then uh, recently we're looking into uh, uh, improvements uh, uh, in classrooms, uh, classroom ventilation, because uh, one aspect that is uh, the same for, uh, for uh, uh, these mechanical solutions is that you have a lot of pupils, uh, you need a lot of air, and uh, Pavel he will come later and tell us how much uh, impor how how important it is to supply very large amounts of air to 
pupils and that this has an effect on their performance. And this is no, this is a difficult task for any ventilation uh, engineer uh, to supply the right amount of fresh air when 28, 32, 35 pupils are sitting in a classroom closely uh, closely together. And to do this without uh, creating uh, drought or uh, creating uh, acoustical problems uh, because uh, the system simply have to the systems have to uh, uh, work so hard. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here we have investigated uh, a combination of a, a what we call diffuse ceiling ventilation where we use the acoustic uh, ceiling which is there because of acoustics in the classrooms. And this is perforated, which means that you can supply air through the uh, through the plenum, which you can see right here, uh, and and then air passes through the perforations, and then uh, down to the uh, pupils in the classroom. And in this way, um, you get a, a very nice distribution of fresh air. You can supply a lot of air because the air velocity through these perforations is 1,000 of the air velocity that you would have in more conventional uh, solutions. And uh, as you can see in the graph here, the noise from from this particular decentral ventilation unit, which is uh, which is noisy because it's sitting in the classroom and in supplying a lot of air, 950 cubic meters per hour which is 34 cubic meters hours per pupil, uh, that's a lot of air and that creates noise problems in many uh, classrooms. And as you can see here, we are in A, B, C, D, in these measuring points, we are well below uh, 35 dB, which is uh, uh, the limit for, uh, uh, for noise in a, uh, in a classroom. And uh, with these remarks on uh, winning concepts, um, I will uh, conclude my presentation and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I will directly pass to Pavel, who is um, sitting, uh, I think, and waiting for his presentation because he has to go on to another one afterwards. So please, Pavel, directly to you. A little bit about the uh, importance of the indoor environmental quality uh, in schools. Uh, basically, I would like to put it all the work that a new school has performed in the perspective of the purpose of the school. And we should remember that the purpose of the school is to create the environment for learning, so that and for teaching, of course, so that. Um, uh, uh, not only that pupils can properly absorb the um, the knowledge, but also that the teachers have a very good uh, conditions in which they can communicate and um, present uh, the, uh, the knowledge to the students. With that said, uh, this is a very special environment. It's unlike the other environments that we look at. If we look at the residential environments or the office environments or the factory, it is here, this is an environment which actually rooms or puts together different type of, uh, from the population, it puts pupils, children, and adults, teachers. Usually occupancy is higher than in other buildings. And uh, certainly it's uh, higher than in dwellings, but uh, it's also higher than in offices. And uh, teaching is carried out in groups, classes with low area volume per person. And um, it requires as little destruction as uh, possible during the teaching. So these are the prerequisites for the proper learning environment that uh, needs to be created in a school. <clears throat> school is uh, also very important uh, if we look at the other aspects of that. It is uh, about 20% of EU's population is using schools. And we are talking about children mostly here, but also <coughs> teachers. And the 20% of the time is spent in school by, uh, by children. So it is a significant, maybe it is a significant part of the exposure during 
this early lifetime uh, if we talk about the elementary school. What is important uh, difference between the working environment and the school environment is that children must attend school. It's very difficult for them to absent themselves and or to find another school. So there are too many problems and limitations here that they can do this. Uh, <clears throat> and also they are they perform uh, a, a usually new new work. So if we go to to offices and work, normally uh, when we perform our work, it usually we perform more or less the similar tasks. Or we use the certain skills that we develop to perform tasks that are more or less uh, not different from the other type of work that we have done before. But the children have to all the time learn something new. And this is something that is not optional. I mean, they have to do this. They have, of course, a, a, a fewer ways of registering complaints. And um, also what is important is that it is still the time where the uh, body of the children, if we talk about elementary schools, especially the lower uh, classes, uh, lower grades, then uh, it's when their body is still developing. So all the organs are still growing and, uh, you know, um, the exposure to that they get during this time is very important, may have important consequences for their health in the future. With that said, it is truly sad to say and appalling to see, to see that if we look at the conditions in schools and the investments in schools in Europe, uh, these are the lowest uh, part, uh, basically they score lowest, both the investments and the conditions in schools. We see the new modern schools, and uh, Armin showed you a couple of examples from Denmark and also from Austria. But this is only a, a small part of the entire population of school buildings in Europe. And this is an example of the actual measured ventilation rates in EU buildings, and you can see that the schools are scoring lowest as the ventilation, as, as regards ventilation uh, rates per person even lower than the dwellings and uh, or the residential environment where you could expect the, that the conditions sh should be worse than in schools. No, it is actually the schools that is the sort of a, uh, our uh, a, a big, biggest problem that, uh, regarding the air quality here and also add, uh, as regards other aspects. So, that's, so sh should we consider that? I mean, because creating the environment may create, uh, may, uh, create uh, uh, a requirement, uh, create, uh, creating the good indoor environmental quality may increase requirement for energy use. So what could be the consequences for poor uh, indoor air quality in buildings, uh, in, in uh, schools? Well, there could be a number of consequences and those consequences have been uh, examined. Uh, there is um, some uh, studies that looked at the different aspects of learning performance. And I think if we talk about learning performance, there are several aspects to it. You can look at the cognitive skills of children, how they are affected. They, you could look at the academic achievement of children. You can look at the academic behavior and engagement in school activities, and also at the attitudes or motivation of uh, children. Certainly, well-being, uh, do I like to go to school or not, and my health conditions will certainly have some indirect effect on learning performance. Let me review and give you a very, very brief account uh, for those, some of those findings uh, in the time available. So if, if we look at cognitive skills, you can look at the different tasks that examine schoolwork. So you can have children uh, performing the um, uh, uh, maybe solving the mathematical tasks or uh, checking the texts for errors and so on. Or you can also use some psychological tests that specifically look at certain skills such as memorizing, concentration, and so on. So if we look at this, this is one of the examples from the very early study from 97, it's a 20-year-old study, in which uh, <clears throat> different cognitive tests measuring uh, reaction time and the concentration were uh, um, <clears throat> observed in relation to the 
level of carbon dioxide concentration in classrooms. Here, carbon dioxide concentration was the indicator of the ventilation efficiency. So this is not a CO2 as the pollutant, but the CO2 as an indicator of ventilation efficiency. And we see the performance is significantly reduced by increasing or by reduced ventilation in the classrooms. So um, also, if you look at this noise, there has been a large study in Europe performed which looked at whether noise, a uh, constant noise level, so along, along uh, if the schools are located close to the traffic, to the uh, uh, road, uh, roads with uh, huge traffic, or to the um, uh, um, to the airports, um, so where there is a, um, a noise, uh, uh, not constant noise, but a, a noise coming from now and then when the airplanes are landing. And they observed that both, both locations are uh, negative for the cognitive skills of children, especially for the comprehension of test and memory, and especially the noise that is produced uh, episodic noise that is produced. So the episodic high noise is very distracting to learning capacity of children. Uh, for the school task, there has been numerous experiments performed in Denmark by our group, which we, in which we looked at the number of different types of mass and language-based tasks and looked at the how air quality affect the performance of those tests. And we observed that the the, uh, the improved air quality in the classrooms here you see is as a increased ventilation rate improves on average the performance of a uh, 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 on those uh, uh, different types of tasks. We talk here about language based tasks is when the children have to read and understand text or the masters when they have to basically do the simple calculations. Also temperature has a negative effect. Here we talk about few percents per one degree in case of a, of a ventilation rate at about 10 percent to 14 percent even by doubling ventilation rate. So too high temperatures have a negative effect on those types of tasks. Another type of way how we can quantify the academic achievements is to look at the standardized tests. So in nearly every country now in Europe has some standardized tests to to observe the, um, uh, the progress in learning. And the, probably the best known standardized test is the PISA test that is used uh, 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 around the world or internationally. So here are a few examples from those tests. And this is one study that was performed in the United States that they looked at the ventilation rates in more than 100 schools and then uh, uh, number of students that were passing the tests on mass and reading, and they observed that the increasing the ventilation rate improved the, the increase the number of students that passed the tests on the. So this here is uh, looking at the ventilation rate and the air quality in the classroom. Here is looking uh, the study looking at the educational test in. Um, Denmark and the type of the ventilation system in in uh, uh, in classrooms and uh, what is can be seen is that in the mechanically in the classrooms with a mechanical balanced ventilation system the the, uh, and the score on the national test is higher than in the naturally ventilated classrooms naturally meaning airing by windows not especially designed natural ventilation systems. Also, temperature has a negative effect on the um, on the performance on standardized tests. And here we see the score on the uh, uh, on the test of mathematics, also in the United States, also in about 100 different schools. So, with the increased uh, temperature, the dot, the dashed line clearly shows that the score on the mathematics test is lower. Also, there is some. Uh, uh, interaction with the ventilation rate as well. The most interesting study has been published last year by the Harvard School of Economics in which they looked at the effects of temperature on the educational attainment of the students uh, leaving the secondary school and taking the exam, or student exam, I, I would say, call, call it, 
what they see here, and it's probably very difficult to read the, uh, the, the graphs, but what they see is that the increased temperature during the, when they took the test or the, the examination caused that uh, uh, lower, uh, lower uh, number of students passed the test. And also the, the exposure to high temperature prior to the uh, taking the test. So in the time before when they were preparing to the examination, during the school year also had a negative effect on the uh, on the score on this test so both temperature noise and air quality have very significant impact on the on the academic achievements um, also on the academic behavior here talking about attendance this is an example of the study from united states showing that uh, the um, uh, uh, proportion of illness absence is reduced by increased ventilation, so improved air quality in classrooms. What are the reasons for that uh, effect? It's difficult to say, and there are different um, um, potential mechanisms that can uh, uh, explain those observed effects. So how about the teachers? So also teachers may be affected, and there is uh, a, a large number of studies showing uh, from offices uh, on the office employees, show, office empl with office employees, showing that the con different conditions, uh, such as poor air quality, temperature, and noise, negatively affect the, the performance of office uh, employees. Which means that it certainly there is some effect that we see uh, in poor classroom conditions on teachers as well, but. There is, has been no dedicated study to look specifically on that particular aspect of the performance of teachers. So, summary remarks. Uh, poorer indoor environmental quality affects learning performance. The effects are not negligible. We are talking about more than 5-10% effects. And the effects may have significant socioeconomic consequences. Those socioeconomic consequences are difficult to quantify today because Today, we observe, we, the effects are today on children, and the children go on the uh, labor market and they produce something that can be, that, that something that can be measurable first in the future. However, there has been, a, in 2010, published uh, uh, results from the analysis of, a, of some data that, uh, of some study that was uh, performed in the United States, by, again, again by the Harvard School of Economics, in which they correlated the uh, kindergarten test scores, uh, of uh, kindergarten class uh, test scores of children, and their average earnings 20 years later, when they were already in work. And the results are clearly showing that the highest score uh, on those tests in the kindergarten class resulted in a higher average uh, earnings, which may suggest that there is a very strong correlation between how the children learn today and how well they perform on, uh, in, at work in the future. So this is all from me. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions or comments to my talk, please send them on the indicator's email address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. Um, I guess you will um, leave. I will the... run. I will run. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much, Pavel. Thank you. We will. Bye. Bye. We have uh, your email address. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay. Um, now to our last presentation, Mikol Matidi from DTTN uh, Habitech. Uh, Mikol, can I ask you to uh, directly present your opportunities for training and awareness raising? Welcome to everybody and thank you for this opportunity. I am I'm Mikol Matedi. I am the European Project Coordinator for Abitech, the cluster company which is leader of this the work package six in the three new school project. Um, the biggest objective was user motivation and small medium enterprise training. The work foreseen in this uh, work package well, included uh, um, the first one, uh, which is educational and training related activities. Uh, 
um, school users uh, uh, have been supported by the partners of the consortium to make pupils conscious about sustainability and other topics related to energy efficiency and good and uh, everything else. And the second main task was uh, to organize uh, uh, specific trainings uh, for professionals and small medium enterprises to be focused on uh, specific topics included in the new school projects uh, like ventilation, use of wood, indoor air quality, and uh, the use of wood prefabricated elements. What I would like to do throughout my presentation is just to show you some output and some actions and trainings uh, which have been uh, successfully concluded in this uh, project. About school's activities, um, everyone knows that school uh, can be a powerful force in driving change towards sustainability uh, within our communities. And teachers are supporting children in generating their own ideas for improving the places in which they learn and live, and to through um, giving the students fun, they can lend also hands-on learning experience. Um, in the consortium, the basic idea was that students play a vital role in reducing school's carbon footprint and uh, due to the fact that they usually energy monitor the lights and the equipment in their own classroom and they are sure that they are switched off when not in use. And the main objectives that you can read uh, were to show and discuss uh, measures and technologies for retrofit of school buildings with school users, both pupils and teachers. So the second one, very important, was to involve and to sensitize children and students about sustainability themes like the energy efficiency, the use of renewable sources, and the use of food. The third one was to give them, in some cases, the instruments to measure the level of sustainability of their classroom and, of course, of their habits at home. And the last one was to give, to feed the curiosity and interest in the mechanisms by which nature sustains life on the planet. And the basic shared and common idea uh, within the consortium was to involve pupils and to develop the necessary skills to enable them to build a sustainable relationship within the environment. I will show you a quick overview of the school activities done uh, um, during the old project uh, um, duration. And we can see that uh, all these partners involved uh, have uh, conducted uh, an activity or more than one in uh, some schools uh, involving a huge number of pupils. For example, the first one uh, I have taken from the report we have made for um, the deliverable for this work package is coming from Holz Cluster Steiermark. Uh, which has made a school action in the city of Osterschwanenstadt in Austria in April 2016. And the number of pupils involved was 265. This example shows you that uh, both teachers and children have been involved uh, in uh, this activity uh, just to uh, present, to give a presentation and a workshop for pupils about the uh, energy efficiency in building to the life cycle approach and the carbon reduction using both. And this activity was uh, 
uh, conducted uh, throughout the show of the presentation and the discussion within all the class involved. And uh, the uh, particular video coming from the new school project uh, was showed just to let children know about the expert interview about indoor climate. The second activity carried out was from Wood Industrial Cluster in Slovenia, and this involved uh, uh, pupils. Uh, coming from the elementary schools. And they, for example, they made a short presentation about the project and they have talked about saving energy uh, through the showing of a short movie about saving energy. And it was very, very interesting for children because they had the chance to touch and they have compared it with uh, stone. Uh, and one of the outputs was that wood is very nice to touch, it's warm, whereas the stone is quite cold and uh, does not transmit the same feeling. They have all talked about construction materials, the different construction materials, and the trainers have shown how and what can be made uh, with wood, for example, bridges, bikes, toys, houses, and musical instruments. The third one is, co is coming from uh, INTEC, uh, and it was an activity um, which has taken place in the city of Pinkafeld in Austria. And also, this was, uh, um, the activities was made for uh, pupils uh, with the uh, age uh, between 15 and 17. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, action has seen the work of two theses structured in the way you can read. Um, there has been investigation and that's work analysis on what has been done in the field of wood and construction and the indoor air quality. Another one is coming from uh, Italy, from Abitech, the Lentina Technological Cluster, and involved people from elementary school. And uh, in this action, a video, an animated cartoon has been showed um, highlighting the bad behaviors and good practices on the teams on energy savings and environment. And children have been asked to focus on some specific aspects, like uh, highlight the good conduct that children can have both at home and at school. And then it has been showed an image of a house which shows uh, many ways that people waste and save energy, and it was asked the children to find them all. And finally, the last topic presented was the theme of recycling objectives, uh, um, and was discussed and very appreciated from pupils. And the last one is coming from Poland, uh, from National Energy Conservation Agency in Warsaw which has conducted an action to students uh, in April 2016. And this activity has been made uh, during the Science Day in Warsaw, and they had uh, a stand with a screen presenting the new school ideas and the project itself. And during this action, uh, several workshops uh, have been provided uh, and the main subject presented was the team of light. So the team from National uh, Agency of Energy in Poland uh, provided lessons and workshops about visual comfort techniques as measure, infrared technology, together with infrared camera presentation. It was more technical, but students were uh, able to understand and to touch with and uh, the technical equipment. Finally, the last example I will show is from the Antwerp from the Netherlands, 
Um, the, this action has been taken during uh, April 2016, and it was involved also the principal of the school and pupils uh, have been highly talented in, in sports and uh, uh, the representative of the schools at 20 minutes open class discussion with pupils on indoor air quality and the energy use in the previous school. And uh, the input coming from pupils was very interesting and relevant because they can show the different experiences in the past compared to the present one. As showed in my introduction, the second biggest uh, task of this uh, work package was to um, set up trainings uh, uh, to small and medium enterprises and to professionals. And as we may know, um, workers and professionals nowadays need to update their competences, especially towards the green technology and sustainability teams in general. And the main objective uh, uh, came from these um, training courses developed were to create and implement specific trainings on teams related to timber construction, specially focused uh, on prefabrication and ventilation requirements. The second one was to allow small medium enterprises and professionals to attend specific workshops, trainings and webinars in the different countries involved in the project. This was set up to update skills with new information related to sustainability and technical teams. And also uh, partners have involved experts in participating to these specific workshops. Each partner, as I mentioned, has identified specific teams and relevant topics to be discussed and added in the development courses in order to keep uh, uh, active the attention and the knowledge on the specific sustainability scheme. All the partners have worked in great synergy in developing common contents and topics to be presented in the different things. And for that reason, uh, each partner has decided to organize courses upon the demand, the target professionals and the small medium enterprise, and of course, the availability of the future from speakers. The dissemination of the use of prefabricated timber models uh, as well as the integration of wood frame windows and ventilation and renewable energy sources in general as a new way of building has been very successful. And in this overview that you can see, uh, uh, we can see that a high number of courses and professionals has participated and attended the proposed trainings. And this, uh, for sure, has contributed in disseminating results and the aim of the project itself. And I will give you a quick overlook on uh, some of the <coughs> Yes? Nicole, sorry. Um, maybe you can only show one example that we can yeah, conclude course. in time. That would be yes. nice. Thank you. Of course. Yes, I will leave also the presentation if every, everybody wants to, to see it. Uh, the example is coming from Holt Cluster Tire Mask uh, in Austria. And the trainings uh, have seen the topics of fast manufacturing, maximum flexibility, the optimum economy, and ecological construction, which have been deeply discussed. And two experts have talked about the practice of these teams from their point of view, both from the construction and the architect. And uh, this workshop was free of charge and the number of participants was 90. And here you can see the flyer and the promotion of the training. So I can conclude and thank you for the attention.
<laughs> Thank yeah, you very much, <laughs> Nicole. Um, I think um, we are, so we concluded we concluded uh, nearly in time. Let's say so. Um, hopefully, Marco can now uh, collect questions or collected questions if there are some, and maybe he can send it to us afterwards. Um, but um, what I want to say is thank you very much for attendance uh, to this webinar. It was also interesting for myself again, and um, hopefully uh, also for all the other ones. And thank you, Marco and um, Technico uh, di Milano Group, uh, also for organizing. Thank you, and I give the words to Marco back. So. Thanks to everybody, uh, Armin and uh, all the speakers, uh, and thanks uh, to all uh, the attendees. Uh, and uh, yeah, we we can find more information about Renew School also on the website. Uh, thanks to all. <clears throat>